For almost four centuries, Shiloh was the religious and administrative capital of the Israelite nation. As the center of Israelite worship, the city is mentioned in the Bible in both Judges and in the book of Joshua. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. Archaeologists recently discovered holes carved into the ground in Shiloh, which could have held the beams of the tabernacle which housed the ark. I'm sure you remember from the Bible that the people, the children of Israel, walked through the Bible for 40 years. And of course the joke goes that they're spending 40 years to look for a place that doesn't have oil, so we don't have all this economic pressure on us and we can be spiritual people and just, you know, tend our vineyards. In the end of 40 years, the Joshua leads the people into the country, crosses the Jordan River, starts to conquer the land, does part of conquering the land, then brings all the people here, right here, so this spot that is where ancient Shiloh, or Shiloh, was situated. Shiloh is a, is a village and a town or a city that was probably inhabited more or less for about 3,000 years. And I'm talking to you about 3,300 years ago. Joshua brings all the people here, and you know, they set up the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle mentioned in the five books of Moses was a a portable tabernacle, a temple that could be taken apart and put back together like Lego, only it was made of acacia wooden and gold-plated with the Ark of the Covenant and the altar and the menorah, the candelabra. And that was brought from place to place. But when they entered the land of Israel, on the one hand, they knew from prophecy that eventually there was going to be this city that will be the city that God will choose that will be the eternal capital. But beforehand, there will be a part-time capital so they brought the, the Ark of the Covenant here and they built a temple, a tabernacle, where the walls were built out of stone, but the roof, the roof was still three layers of curtain. To say on the one hand, we're in a more permanent state than we were beforehand, but we know this still isn't the eternal capital. But still, you know, Jews today in the Passover uh, Seder night, at the end of the entire ceremony, they say next year in Jerusalem which is what we've been saying for 3,000 years. But beforehand, for 369 years, Jews would say at the end of the Passover Seder night, they would say next year in Shiloh. God willing, everyone should be health healthy, and we're going to make the pilgrimage to Shiloh, which is right here, this hilltop here. And it's situated in central, in the central area of the land of Israel, if you want, in the uh, inheritance of the tribe of Ephraim. And it was from here that Joshua Split, the, split up the, uh, the country, giving every tribe its uh, land, piece of the land, to go out and to conquer and to settle and to build and to develop. And for 369 years, there was a spiritual capital. There was no political capital because we lived as tribes. And it's, it was a period, the entire book of the judges is a period of, of growing up. It's like a teenager. On the one hand, you want to be close to, to your father in heaven. On the other hand, you're also rebelling you're growing up and so you understand who you are, where your place, what your place is in the world. So the Book of the Judges is a time of we were teenagers and all the tribes were more or less separate and there were ad hoc alliances against a particular a foe or an enemy. But what, what brought them all together was the tabernacle, the temple in Shiloh here where people would come three times a year. Now what's most famous is the opening the book of Samuel we find the last of the judges Eli Eli who was the last high priest served the people for 40 years and on the day that he became a high priest he saw this woman who was speaking without saying words and she was swaying I guess and he thought that she was drunk and her name was Hannah or Hannah and she was actually prayer, praying because she had no children. And her husband, Elkanah, was a unique person who, by personal example, every year would go up on this pilgrimage to Shiloh, to here, and every time he would take a different route, and those people that had given up on God or given up on going on this pilgrimage, they would ask him, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm going to worship God in the, in the house of the Lord in, in Shiloh. If you want, you can come with me. And without preaching to them, just being an example, he uplifted their spirit and brought people back to, the, to Shiloh. And... Hannah, Hannah, she prayed for her son that, can, can, that will continue this work. And Eli saw her praying silently, moving her lips without saying anything, and he, and he thought that she was drunk. 
and he said to her, you know, how long are you going to be drunk here in the house of God? And, and we're going to see that. We're going to see more or less where she stood in the courtyards of the tabernacle that stood here for almost 370 years. And she said that I'm not drunk, that I'm, that I'm a bitter person. And, and Eli said to her, you know, well, God will grant you whatever you, you prayed for. And she had a lot of faith. And she took that, as the high priest said, that God's going to listen to her prayer. It's going to... So she was. She went home happy, and she gave birth to a to a son who is uh, Samuel. Okay, and Samuel was the one that grew up here. She brought him back when he was about three years old, and she, he grew up here. On the one hand, he saw the corruption that was here, that caused eventually spiritually caused the, the divine retribution and the destruction of the tabernacle here, by the Philistines. On the other hand, so he grew up here and he saw the destruction. On the other hand, he became I guess you could call him the first circuit preacher. He went from place to place to uplift the spirit of the people and say, you know, it depends on our bettering ourselves morally and spiritually. And if we make ourselves stronger people spiritually and morally, and we fix the corruption that was here that caused the destruction, then we'll, be, we'll come together and we'll be able to move forward. So Samuel was the unique prophet who saw the destruction, but he also was the one that anointed Saul as the, uh, as the first king. And later, King David, who was the king that we believe is all the kings of, uh, of Israel, stem from his line. Now Saul, it says in the Bible, in the book of Samuel, that there was a, a refugee that came from the, from the battle when the Ark of the Covenant fell into the hands of the, police, of the Philistines. And he came from the battle, and it says that all the city was in a panic when they saw him. Because we think that he came from the south, where the battle took place in the, the coastal plain, and he crossed the entire city here all the way to the northern end to where the tabernacle was. And he gave the news to, to the high priest, Eli, Eli saying that his, his sons were killed and Israel was defeated in battle and the army has dispersed and the Ark of the Covenant has fallen captive. And that's when Eli heard that and he fell off his chair and he broke his neck and he was 90 years old and he passed away. And that is when, since there, was, since there was no Israeli army, that's when the army of the Philistines came and they destroyed the city of Shiloh. And that's kind of written between the lines. But if you read the Psalms carefully, then you see how God became angry with the, the tent of Joseph and burned the tent of uh, Joseph, which means Shiloh here was burned. And in the archaeology, they found a, a, a level of ash, a level of strata where there's ash. We can see a destruction. And later, a... Shiloh was rebuilt, and during the time of the first temple, there were there were houses here. You can even I can even point out a uh, the walls of a house that when I ask the archaeologist, I ask him, "Where's this house from?" And he says, "This is a fortified house from the Second Iron Age." And I ask him, "What does that mean in English?" You know, the Second Iron Age. I explain it to him, to a layman. He says, "During the time of King Ahab, now not the captain Ahab, King Ahab." And I thought for a second, being a rabbi, I thought to myself, okay, King Ahab, kind of, he wasn't the most sympathetic person, so what can I relate this to? And I, oh, wait, you know, suddenly I had this idea. You mean, this is a house from the time of Elijah the prophet? Wow. I thought, wow, it's like... And then he pointed out a wall, in, that's kind of a wall of a house that's still in the ground. He thought, I'm not sure, but I think that's a house from the time of Joshua. And then I asked him about this underground house. There's a, ground, there's a house that's dug into the, into the bedrock. I asked him, when is this from? He says, well, it could be from the time of the Second Temple, but I believe as an archaeologist, it's from the time of the judges, from the time that the tabernacle was here in, in Shiloh. Whenever I, ever, whenever I enter that, that house, I always think to myself, well, I was here you know, over 3,300 years ago, and Eli was just down the street. He was the high priest. It says in Hebrew that they would dance in a in a circle. Cholelu, they dance in a circle. When you dance in a circle, and you give hand, you give your hand to the person to to your right, and you give your hand to the person to your right to your left. You don't lose your individuality. You're still a row all by yourself. But on the other hand, you're creating this circle within an area that's all separate rows. It's like saying we're striving for unity without without negating the the uniqueness of any of any individual.